Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to another one of our virtual tours of outer space. My name is Josh. I'm part of the Morrison Planetarium team at the California Academy of Sciences, and I am privileged to be a chance to beam from my home to yours, one of our virtual tours of outer space. You'll have to excuse my dog. He's very excited to have me home doing this broadcast again. He is outside my window barking like a madman. But if you hear weird stuff, that's probably what's going on. So we are doing our virtual tour of outer space, this time looking at the open space software, which is something you can actually check out at home. And we are somewhere in our solar system. Now, I've thrown that in the comments. We've seen some great guesses about where we are. Could be Europa, could be Sharon, could be the moon, could be Earth even. But this gray and white surface is the default version of Pluto in open space. So if you want to check this out, go to the openspaceproject.com. You can download it, set it up on your computer, and see the exact same view I'm showing you here. Now, this is just a black and white relief of Pluto. But what I think is really absolutely fascinating on this one is it shows you so much of the texture. You don't get as much of the topography, the actual change in the height of the model, but you don't really need it. Because of this beautiful black and white relief, it's almost like you could imagine running your hand over the surface of Pluto and feeling the smooth parts versus the bumpy parts. It's always kind of a cool thing to imagine when you're looking at a surface like this, exactly what it would be like to interact with it in some way. Smelling a planet is sort of in the abstract, hard for me to imagine inhaling the surface of a world, but for touch, uh, maybe taste, that sounds a little gross for a lot of these places. But for touch and sight specifically, I think it's a really fun way to challenge yourself and really try and take these things in a different way. So looking around here on Pluto, you can see a ton of wrinkly features. These are some of those mountains we've seen previously, spots where we see uh, sharp mountains. These are mountains way too sharp to be carved from rock in much the same way we think of mountains here on Earth. I'm going to ask Mary if she can throw my photo back on again, my image because I feel like this is something where hands benefit. So on Earth, if we've got uh, the crust of our planet bumping into each other, you could imagine that we have two pieces slamming into each other. Sometimes one sinks beneath the other, forcing one up and the other down. That's what we call a subduction zone. Other times we see them bash into each other and both rise up. But when we have big mountain ranges here on Earth, it pretty much necessitates rock slamming into each other. On Pluto, we see something totally different. On Pluto's surface, we really do get a chance to see those mountains being formed by the sun. Now, that's kind of strange. How could a mountain be formed by the sun? Well, when the rocky surface isn't rock but ice, sunlight would energize some of those atoms, cause them to turn from a solid ice into a gaseous steam, a process we call sublimation, and it would escape off the surface. We know Pluto does have a very thin atmosphere. One of the most compelling shots taken by the New Horizons mission was the atmosphere of Pluto being illuminated from the sun. The shot was taken from behind Pluto, and it gave us a really beautiful view of Pluto as an atmosphere-bearing world. So I've spent a ton of time on Pluto. There are tons of other places in our solar system that would be great to visit. If you, ooh, a question about computer architecture I will actually refer you not to me. I love flying around open space, but I will say that if you have questions about how open space runs or the best place to install open space, I would recommend checking out their Slack channel. I'm a member of the presenting part of the Slack channel, but Slack is a really cool program where you can actually interface with the people who make open space go and ask them really in-depth questions. I will say I have no idea what kind of computer architecture best use is. Uh, or best utilized for open space, but there are definitely people there who can. I saw a response come in for a good suggestion on where to go. Sapphire says we should go check out Jupiter. I think that sounds like a lovely idea. So building on that idea we touched on before of imagining what a planet would be like to interact with, Jupiter is a very different part, a very different idea. When we think of Jupiter, you can't really imagine touching its surface. There wouldn't be any texture to it because Jupiter's a gas giant. What you would feel would be sort of a strange change of phase. The outer part would be gaseous. The inner part would be more liquid. And then the innermost parts would be solids. The gaseous outer part is hydrogen. The liquid part is hydrogen. And the solid part is hydrogen. Turns out pretty much all of Jupiter's hydrogen, bits of helium and other stuff mixed in. 
But when we're talking about the composition of Jupiter, this is fundamentally different than we see on Pluto, fundamentally different than Earth. This is not any measure a rocky world or an icy world. This is a gaseous world. Now, the solid hydrogen is something kind of unusual. We've talked about potentials for solid hydrogen here on planet Earth. Some people think it could be a perfect superconductor. For sure, it acts like a metal in some interesting ways. Now, that's exciting because that means that almost the entirety of Jupiter acts like a metal, giving it one of the most prodigious magnetic fields in our solar system, second only to the sun. Now, it looks like Laura and Harini had some requests for the extreme outer parts of our solar system, but uh, let's head out there. I think I might take a quick detour. Natalie asked for one of Jupiter's moons. So before we head too far from Jupiter, I promise we will get to some of those outer spots too, but let's go check out some of these Galilean moons. Now, when you look at the Galilean moons right there going around Jupiter, it almost looks like our inner part of our solar system. If I told you that was the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, some people might believe me. There's kind of a close analog here, especially when we look at solar systems different than our own. We've actually found the Trappist-1 solar system, extra solar system, I guess, technically, where we have a lot of planets at about the same distance as Jupiter's moons from Jupiter orbiting a small red star. So it's got a ton in common. Uh, so let's check out one of those moons. I think it is high time we go visit Io because Io doesn't get much love. Sometimes called Io by people who studied classics in university. A lot of astronomers just call it Io or input output. But uh, this is the most volcanic moon of Jupiter by a long shot. In fact, it's one of the most volcanic bodies in the solar system. Just tons and tons of volcanoes dotting the surface. I like to say it looks like a really gross pizza. You would definitely not get too many arguments from anybody on that score. Not really a pizza you want to eat, though. But a lot of those same colors. It's got white. It's got yellows. It's got reds. And we think that's because of some of these volatile volcanic compounds that are getting pushed up onto the surface. So potentially stuff like sulfur. You talk about touching a planet. This would probably be a fairly smooth one with a lot of bumps. Maybe a little warm on the surface. And you could imagine smelling a world like this would not be at all pleasant because... Sulfur really doesn't smell great to human beings. However, no atmosphere. There's no envelope of gas wrapped around this world. So inhaling a deep whiff probably gets you nothing. Okay, so let's go try some of our outer worlds, Uranus and Neptune. I'm not going to make the cheap joke about the smells of Uranus because I'm above that, and I hope you are too. But as we zoom out farther into our solar system, we get to see that third class of planets. We saw a rocky-esque world with Pluto. We saw a gaseous world with Jupiter. This is an ice giant. An ice giant is, again, totally different, but again, a really cool visceral imagination spot. Imagine walking on a world like this. You would settle in beneath those deep, hazy, bluish clouds, and as you got closer and closer to the surface, it stop being a gaseous world and start being a solid liquid world. What do I mean by that? The best analogy I've heard is if you get uh, one of those icy drinks from a convenience store, it would probably be very similar. We're talking about an icy slushy matrix with a dense fluid suspended within. So that really sounds like a slushy or a slurpee, depending on which convenience stores you frequent. When you look at these clouds, that is absolutely beautiful. We've got white clouds, we've got dark clouds, we've got this hazy yellowy region with slightly different surface composition than the other regions of Uranus because, well, that's the polar region. When we look to the pole, you can see it's facing approximately in the direction of the sun. And that means that this is a world that has a very strange motion through our solar system where the other planets sort of spin like tops. This one rolls like a ball. Very strange comparatively. Now, we checked out Uranus. It's also, of course, time to check out Neptune because the two often come as a set. Perhaps the most tragic reason we pair these worlds together is because we don't know that much about either of them. Turns out the outer worlds of our solar system remain a huge mystery for astronomers, and that's kind of a tragic thing because, well, we don't know much about these worlds because we've never sent a mission to them. Once upon a time, we had planned missions to go and do flybys, close up, and even orbits of Uranus and Neptune. However, those missions have never come to fruition. Every time they appear on the slate of potential upcoming missions from a space agency, they have been cut. And that, to me, is just absolutely tragic. 
I would love one day to have really concrete knowledge about these places, to better understand the chemistry that's happening at the upper atmosphere, middle atmosphere, lower atmosphere, the composition of what's going on inside, how the elements change based on the amount of light they receive from the sun. But we're going to have to wait a long time for that because it's just not on the top of anyone's agenda. And one of the reasons this is so compelling is because when we first began finding planets around other stars, the biggest ones we found were Jupiter sized. That's huge. Then we began finding smaller and smaller worlds. And the more of those smaller worlds we found, the more common they became with respect to Jupiter's. So right now we can say there are more small Uranus and Neptune sized planets out around other stars shown by this exoplanet database showing us all the planets we have found to date. When we find those worlds, we're able to say, yes, there are a lot of Jupiters, but there are even more Uranuses and Neptunes. Well, if these planets are so common, shouldn't we know more about them? Shouldn't we study the ones that are closest to us a little better so we can make better guesses about these distant worlds? I would argue yes. But other people point out that this could be a artifact of how we discover planets. At first, finding big planets was easiest, so we found the most of those. Now we're finding smaller and smaller planets and finding more of them. Maybe that means there will be even more Earth-like planets out there once we get those methods really dialed in. Right now, we aren't expert at finding small Earth-like planets, even smaller than Earth. We have found a few, for sure, but we have not found the bulk of them, we think. Once that data starts pouring in, it is entirely possible that we will have to reset our understanding of planetary populations and really take a big look at which worlds we are studying to better understand planets as a whole. Okay, so we had a couple other awesome suggestions pop in. Let's see, there was definitely one in the solar system. I think we had a question about the hexagon of Saturn, but then we can go check out some of these beautiful... Neb well, we're looking at the beautiful nebular features now, so why not? We have the smaller and greater Magellanic clouds right here. These strange spirally shapes you can actually see from the Southern Hemisphere and from some areas pretty close to the Southern Hemisphere, but you can't see them from where I live for sure. They're always below the horizon. That's proof we live on a sphere in case you have any arguments around the Thanksgiving table with someone who believes that we are on a flat thing. If we were on a flat thing, all of us would get to see the whole sky and astronomers as a whole would be a lot happier, less sullen. But when you look here, you can see this spiral shape. That is the Greater Magellanic Cloud, the Larger Magellanic Cloud, pardon me. When you look at it, you really do get that kind of S shape, a backwards S. This is a dwarf galaxy orbiting our own Milky Way. And where's the Milky Way? Well, in this view, it is hard to miss. I'm going to attempt to fly straight backwards a huge distance. And as I do, I'm going to see if we have our volumetric Milky Way loaded up. Because boy, let me tell you, this is one of my favorite things to do in open space. If you're ever having a bad day, I will give you Josh's patented fix. Open up a software like this, turn on really loud music, go out to about 100 light years away, and just orbit. And all of a sudden, all of your difficult problems seem so small in comparison. They just kind of disappear. Okay, so continuing out farther and farther and farther. Let's see, is it loaded up? It seems to be. This is our galaxy wrote right large. This is our very own Milky Way. Now, when you look at the Milky Way, it just appears to us as that bar shape across the sky because we're used to seeing it sort of from within where it just appears flat. We can't see this nice glowing bit in the middle because of all the gas and dust between us and it. It blocks our view. Now, when we look at this, it is a powerful reminder that our galaxy is made of hundreds of billions of stars. Count's estimate are very significantly. Some of them put it at around 200 billion. Others put it up to 400 billion. A lot of conservative astronomers put us at around 300 billion just by averaging those out, getting a best guess. So looking around here, you can actually see sort of the bar that makes up the middle part. And some models of our galaxy have a slightly warped disk. This one seems to have a fairly flat one. But when we look at it, you can still see those lanes, these strong arms of our galaxy. And if you look exactly where we lie, we actually fall between two major arms in what's called the Orion Spur. Why is it called the Orion Spur? Because most of the bright stars of Orion fall right on the outer edge of that structure. So as we zoom in to our neighborhood, you're going to notice something super cool out here. 
we had a request for Betelgeuse, which is right there, that bright red star, and a nebula. And this is a twofer because this is Orion. Now, I know what you're thinking. Are you sure that's Orion? That looks pretty funky. Well, look at its position on the sky. You can see this dark structure behind it. That is the majority of the Orion Spur. And as I dive in, you're going to see, boom, there's the figure of Orion as we are used to seeing it. Three stars for the belt. The Orion Nebula hiding inside the scabbard hanging at his belt. You can see the smaller and larger foot down there. Betelgeuse, that's Rigel down there. This is a beautiful constellation, one that we don't often get to see from any perspective but our own stuck here in the Milky Way. Okay, getting a little closer. Hexagon of Saturn. I promised we were going there, and then I got super distracted, as is my want. This is my favorite show to give, folks, I got to say, because we just get to wander around the solar system and see some of the coolest stuff around. So diving into Saturn, I want to show you one of my favorite coolest things you can see right now is that bite out of the rings from sh the Saturn shadow falling upon it. So the slit of Saturn's shadow is a very tough sentence to say. Don't try it at home or do. But looking down here, it's not super visible in this color imagery. But if you look at some black and white and infrared shots you can find online, the hexagon is brilliantly visible. Now, looking right here, you can see one straight line, two straight lines, three straight lines, four straight lines, five straight lines, six straight lines. That makes a hexagon. Now, that's a weird feature, to be sure. We don't often see sort of geometric shapes popping up in nature. But looking around here, you will notice this hexagon is a stable shape. It's a geometric shape. That's super cool. And it's big. You could fit about two and a half Earths across the great hexagon. That's huge. Now, to call it a storm might be a little bit of sensationalism, but it is definitely a set figure in the clouds. When we've tried to simulate uh, a shape like this here on planet Earth, the most recent computer simulations I heard about were describing it as they could make it, but it always had little tiny storms at each one of the points on the hexagon. And that's not what we see here. So we're still not entirely sure how you get a stable shape like this to exist as long as it has, which is a pretty awesome and exciting thing. Okay, let's see where we're going next. Mars, wonderful suggestion, Harini. Let's go check it out. When do I think human beings will live on Mars? Ooh, uh, I really do think that human beings are capable of making it to Mars, setting up an environment, and surviving there. Whether or not we will have a stable human population, like farming, growing their own food, really making Mars theirs, colonizing it, I'm less sure. I'm excited for the possibility. I definitely think that human beings could make a better go on another planet and practice better policies once we're there. But I don't think we're ready to make a stable, big human population on Mars for a long, long time. And I say that with the very careful statement of, I think we should, but I think we should do it slowly, carefully, and in a way that protects human life and protects Mars. Uh, if human beings decide we can't survive on Earth and we have to go live on Mars, I think human beings are doing a really dumb thing, and I think it's going to bite us in our behind. Earth is an Earth-like planet. It is a wonderful, stable place to be. Making another place more like Earth is going to be a lot more difficult than keeping Earth Earth-like. So I don't think human beings should ever run away from Earth to try and survive somewhere else. I love the idea of us slowly expanding someplace, but that's not the cool, awesome pro-technology answer we often hear. So let's do Mars. Let's do Mars carefully. Let's build up colonies there over a long period of time. And let's find ways to support life on Earth as well. But looking around Mars, where do I think we should go? Well, I'm a big fan of the science fiction series, The Expanse. And they talk about a bunch of very realistic, kind of like the Martian, ideas about where human beings might live. And one of them is right here. So if you lived on Mars in the far future, like the Expanse, this could be some primo territory. Because a lot of people on Mars would probably live underground. It's a great way to protect yourself from uh, harmful particles from the sun. Radiation that could damage our genes. So if you wanted to set up shop on Mars and live there... Well, a lot of the housing would probably be very dark, very cramped, underground areas. 
if you wanted a nice sky view, which we know people on Earth are willing to pay top dollar for, probably in the cliff face of Valles Marineris would be a great spot to build. And the nice part about Valles Marineris is you don't really have to worry about limited property because, oh boy, is this thing big. It is 2,000 miles long. From end to end, there would be plenty of spots for people to build and have a beautiful view of the outside surface of Mars. That sounds super cool. Okay, so a little bit of Mars flying. Any other questions popping up? Do we want to spend more time on Mars? Do we want to go someplace else? Oh, I heard they're using the moon for a base. So the moon is another cool spot where human beings might live. And I will tell you, if you want to know more about our potential for living on the moon or living on Mars, you should check out some of our cosmic conversations uh, and listen to the real experts tell you about it. We had a question from Natalie about is Earth's moving over? Why Earth's moon is moving away from the Earth and Mars' moons are moving closer to Mars? Cool question. Uh, it has everything to do with tidal interactions, which can get a little complicated. But basically, our moon is receiving energy from Earth and getting boosted into a bigger and bigger, more energetic orbit. Mars is stealing energy from its moons, which take energy away from it and bring them into smaller and smaller orbits. So... Our moon is moving away from us because of tidal interaction. Mars's moons are moving closer to it because of that same sort of tidal interaction. And if that's confusing, I've got two textbooks for you to check out. Sorry, my dog's going bananas again. So could we live on the moon? It would be a little bit more challenging in some ways than Mars, but also a little less in others. It's a lot easier for us to bring resources to the moon. For sure, the moon is so much closer to us. What resources would we need to bring there? Well... As of recently, not water, because there's plenty of water on the moon. So living on the moon probably got a lot easier. We also think there's water on Mars. So living on Mars might be a little easier too. We would have to bring air to both places, at least some air, because while there is water there and you can break hydrogen uh, and oxygen apart and breathe the oxygen, you still need a lot of nitrogen. Humans breathe mostly nitrogen. If you breathe an all oxygen environment, it can get real bad real fast. Because anytime a spark happens, you are risking a huge fire. And that's a very scary thing in space. So we would need to bring air. We would need to bring a lot of food. Because even if we could eventually grow our own food in these places, you'd need to bring seeds. And you'd need to bring enough food for you to survive on until you were able to harvest some food. So blasting food to the moon is going to be a lot easier than blasting food to Mars. And for that sole reason, I would say it's going to be easier for us to survive on the moon. The challenges come from stuff like gravity. On the moon, you only weigh about one-sixth of what you weigh here on Earth. So a 60-pound kid only weighs 10 pounds. That's really small. So in trying to imagine what things would be like on the surface of the moon, we'd need to find ways for astronauts to exercise, kind of like they do on the ISS, to make sure that your body stayed strong and returning to Earth was a safe thing for you to do. Okay, we had a bunch more questions pop up. Looks like some of those were about the moon and Mars. A question, oh, about the shape of the Milky Way from our current observations. Very cool question, Dan. So when we look at the Milky Way, all we see is this bar across the sky. And if you look at some of the earliest drawings of the Milky Way, they reflect exactly what we saw, that there was kind of this strange shape. I think it's Captain's illustration of the Milky Way is basically exactly what he saw. He thought there were giant bites taken out of it. But then we began to realize that this wasn't an absence of stars. All these dark regions here are actually the presence of something else. They're dark clouds of gas and dust that are blocking light. There's not just an absence of light. The light was there, and then it got absorbed by something else. So with that picture, we began mapping where we see dust. Using infrared light, the dust itself actually glows. By changing what we're seeing, we can see that there's a lot of dust here. There's a lot of dust over there. There's a lot of dust over there. But still, that doesn't explain the whole shape of our galaxy. So what we actually did was we began looking out into these dark spots away from the plane of our galaxy, and we found tons and tons of other galaxies. So what I would say the best analogy I could give, Mary, I'm going to ask for my picture again because I'm going to wave my hands around again, is imagine going to a fancy dress party. Okay, We're talking like medieval masks. You don't know what mask you put on but you could sort of feel it. Like maybe it's got big eyebrows and a big nose. 
And as you're looking around, you're seeing a lot of other similar masks that have a big nose and big eyebrows. So even if you don't know what your mask looks like, you can compare it to some others and find a close match. And that's almost exactly what we did for galaxies. We mapped out what dust we could, and then we began looking at other galaxies to try and match the shape as closely as possible to what we could observe. Using that process, we still have a pretty good guess. You can see this bar shape means that we've got a flat disk. We have presence and absence of gas at dis different distances, so we're pretty sure we have spiral arms. And we have recently discovered that there's probably a big area, the Monoceros ring right outside our galaxy that's not quite as luminous, and we've got this funny cantilevered shape. When you add all those things together, we have never found a perfect match galaxy for the Milky Way, but we found a lot that seemed to show similar features. By comparing ourselves to them, we think we've got a pretty good map of our galaxy. Oh, and a question about the black hole in the very center of the Milky Way. I think this is a great thing to go out on. I'm going to back up one last time, and I'm going to show you where we see that black hole way at the center of our galaxy. So we are about 30,000 light years from the middle of the Milky Way. And that means that the light coming to us from the center of the galaxy is 30,000 years old. That's not an insignificant amount of time. So we are seeing light that left this area 30,000 years ago. When you look at this giant glowing region, that's what we call the central bulge of the Milky Way. And in this bulge, you'll notice it's a different color than the outside arms. In the outside arms, the red stuff comes from glowing gas and some of it from small red stars. The blue stuff is mostly coming from very energetic bright blue stars. There's a lot of them out here. There aren't as many down here. This is a gas poor region and it has a lot of older stars. So way down here in the middle, we have our population one star, excuse me, our population two stars. Population two stars are much, much older. We see them as yellows and reds generally. There are yellows and reds out here, but the blue ones kind of are brighter overall, even if they're less populous. When you look down here, it's all yellows and reds. Now they're orbiting around the middle of our galaxy and way down there at the very center is that supermassive black hole. When we talk about the supermassive black hole in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy, we are talking about a big object. Now, how big is it? I'm checking this out. It's about 4 million solar masses. Now, that means it's 4 million times heavier than our sun. It is probably the heaviest thing in the Milky Way. But does that mean everything is orbiting it? No. Remember before when I talked about how many stars make up the Milky Way? We're talking about, let's say, 300 billion. So 300 billion solar masses-ish compared to 4 million. This thing is tiny in relation to the rest of the galaxy. So yes, while it is at the very center, it's the densest thing around. So it makes sense that it would drift to the lowest gravitational potential point, the middle. It's not like it's pulling everything else around it. It's more like it's the biggest thing in the area. It's sitting right at the middle. It's moving the least of all, but it's not like it's sucking everything else down a giant cosmic drain. So with that, I think I'm going to take us back in towards planet Earth, which strangely enough, we never visited on this trip. I feel bad. But uh, for Priyanka, we can definitely have that one last dive in to see uh, my favorite planet currently, our very own planet Earth. So I'd like to thank all of you for joining us here for our virtual tour of outer space. If you have any questions that we didn't get to or you got excited about something that you want to share for next time, please tune in next week. I always love to see folks tuning back in. But with that, thank you all for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Download Open Space. Let us know what you think. Stay home, stay happy, stay healthy, and we hope to see you soon.